Outside the government, we need partnerships to maintain the cybersecurity of our nation. We have to work with industry. You know, we have HECO here today. You know, our, our critical infrastructure, our key resources, we can't protect those alone. Our allies, people overseas, we have to work together. Some of our allies have capabilities. We don't. We have capabilities some of our allies don't. They're allowed to do things we aren't allowed to do and, and vice versa. Academia, we're not going to get better at this by just throwing money at it. We have to have smart people with bright ideas working innovatively to show us the next level in cybersecurity. Uh, think like quantum computing, uh, quantum ciphers, all that kind of good stuff. And foreign partners. Partners who are not necessarily our allies do not mean that we don't count on them and we don't work on, with them. So foreign partners and allies are key to progressing in cyber. And, you know, I can't be a DOD guy and have slides and not have a quote from the SecDef. So uh, here, here's a good uh, quote from uh, current SecDef, Ash Carter. And you can see that uh, cyber touches every aspect of all of our lives, and that makes it important. Okay, uh, I'm going to hand it over now to Ross. Uh, he's got a slide, and he'll introduce himself. Thanks, Kevin Grady. Um, I'm going to save my slide for first question. It's sort of a, a teaser. But... Um, I'm uh, Ross Rowley. I lead the Energy Innovation Office up at U.S. Pacific Command. I'm a proud graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy in 1980. Any Navy or uh, West Point graduates out there, raise your hands. Good luck in the Losers Bowl in the Army-Navy game. <laughs> uh, I've been at Pacific Command for about eight years since retiring from active duty, leading the Energy Innovation Office. We've done a variety of things, including a uh, microgrid project called SPIDERS, Smart Power Infrastructure Demonstration for Energy Reliability and Security. We did quite a bit of cyber testing, red teaming, and uh, other uh, cyber vulnerability analysis with that microgrid. It's defending uh, three different installations, critical infrastructure. Since then, uh, that concluded uh, about a year ago, we've been um, involved in a thing called ESTCP, Energy S Environmental Security Technology Certification Program with Hawaiian Electric Company, Pacific Northwest National Lab, uh, and NAFAC XWIC, where we're going to do additional red teaming at the lab on a new array of technologies and then bring them to the Hawaiian Electric Company power plant to actually see if what we observe in the lab works on a, on a real power grid. I'm also uh, starting to get involved in a project called Unified Cause up at PACOM that just got funded this year, which is a grid resiliency kind of project. So uh, that's my focus is critical infrastructure cyber protection. Thanks. Uh, Trevor Jones, uh, <clears throat> currently uh, working at PACOM. Uh, Chief of Mission Assurance within the uh, J6 and Joint Cyber Center. Um, uh, arrived there in, uh, in 2013, uh, and that position did not exist um, <laughs> before, uh, before I started. It's always a, it's a wonderful thing. You get to define your own future, make your own bed. Um, I made it pretty messy at first, but, uh, but it's getting better. Um, so the focus there is uh, essentially integration with, um, with our overall Mission Assurance uh, program at PACOM. Uh, we do that by uh, partnering with our J3 uh, lead for uh, the critical infrastructure program. Um, so our, 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 our goal is to essentially uh, prioritize what we do for defense uh, by uh, focusing on those things that are most, most important operationally. Um, I don't want to necessarily spend my entire uh, uh, breadth of knowledge on, on an introduction. Um, but that, but that's, that's the area that, uh, that I focus. Uh, prior to that, I, I did work at uh, PACAF at a, uh, as a uh, uh, comm planner, uh, and uh, prior to that was uh, Air, Force, Air Force comm officer for 10 years, so, so that's, that's where I come from. Awesome, thanks. thanks. Uh, Dr. Runcer. Yeah, good afternoon. So I'm Robert Runcer. I'm the technical director of NSA Hawaii here on the island of Oahu. I am also the research director at liaison here in Hawaii, for NSA headquarters. Uh, for those of you not familiar with NSA Hawaii, we are a few thousand men and women in both civilian and military uh, backgrounds uh, executing uh, NSA's national security mission on behalf of both our national customers as well as our local customers, principally the United States Pacific Command. In that capacity, we conduct both signals intelligence as well as information assurance missions. Those of you probably in this audience are very familiar with both. But just to review, signals intelligence is providing our leaders, both our political officials as well as our military, 
commanders with the latest information related to adversarial communications or other types of information that they need to protect the United States. And we're very active here in NSA Hawaii in focusing on the Pacific theater as that is uh, the focus of our primary customer here, Paycom. On the information insurance side, of course, our goal is to protect critical uh, infrastructure for uh, the military, for the United States government, as well as to protect um, unauthorized access to some of our nation's most sensitive networks and information. So when it comes to encrypting information, establishing secure communications um, at the highest classifications level, that is NSA's responsibility. And so we've learned throughout our entire history uh, the different means by which um, those who might want to gain access to our networks try to get in, and we try to prevent that uh, from even occurring. As an example, some of our classified information has to be protected well beyond 30 years. So if you try to imagine what the threat landscape might be in the next 30 years, we have people at NSA who have to think about that problem and then put solutions in place today that are future-proof. One of the other things that um, NSA does here locally, we do have teams that do malware analysis, cybersecurity um, uh, types of uh, operations to um, harden networks, to do penetration testing, mostly in the dot mill uh, or uh, federal government domains. Um, and we can provide some of that information to the private sector through our partnerships with FBI as well as DHS. It's important to kind of uh, distinguish the authorities, even though NSA right, has uh, a lot of knowledge about cyber. We're not the only players in the intelligence community. There are other players that have other information. DHS and FBI mostly have the domestic authorities to provide that information to the operators of critical infrastructure, as well as to other organizations like state and local entities that might have those concerns. And as we go through the panel, I'm sure we'll discuss the importance, but I can't emphasize uh, this, and you'll hear this throughout my talk, about building a cyber-aware culture through STEM outreach and education. Um, we are obviously very interested in hiring here on Oahu in the state of Hawaii uh, for some of our positions in the cyber landscape, but most importantly, that is a skill that the United States needs in the private sector. It needs it in state and local government because cyber is everywhere, right? We need to protect our networks no matter how big or how small, and that starts actually with individual users. Uh, oftentimes, it's the users of the technology that are the target, not the technology itself. So the more we can inculcate that culture, both in our workforce and at home and in the career paths of some of those in the K through 12 and, of course, at the university level, the more protected the United States infrastructure will become. So I look forward to talking to you all about um, how we can do that uh, working together today. Thank you. Brian? Good afternoon. Brian Tepper. I am the Information Assurance Manager for Hawaiian Electric. I handle all of the uh, information security and privacy for Hawaiian Electric, Maui Electric, Hawaiian Electric Light, and Hawaiian yeah, Electric Industries. We, do, uh, we provide the electricity to everybody up here on the stage, quite frankly. About 95% <laughs> of uh, everyone here in Honolulu, uh, Hawaii, except the island of Kauai. We, um, uh, prior to this, actually, I am retired from the, uh, the FBI. I was the uh, National Program Manager and Unit Chief for the uh, FBI's Regional Computer Forensic Laboratories. We did all the digital analysis on all the evidence in about 16 different metropolitan areas. We had 152 uh, police agencies involved with us and did a uh, tremendous amount. We did processing for almost uh, 800 uh, police uh, departments throughout the U.S. with that. So uh, that was uh, quite interesting. I look forward to talking about some of the, uh, the cybersecurity issues that we deal with. And uh, I've got a few slides. I'm going to actually hold those until the first question, too. Hold on okay. the first question, I. Thanks. Aloha. Good question. afternoon. My name is Eric Husher. I am the Chief Security Officer at NC TAMS PAC. You may wonder what that acronym means. Uh, basically, that is an organization that we uh, communicate with the ship fleet. This is a, we have a big ocean around us, and so we're the, the main hub for providing those kind of communications to our float force. And my responsibilities in that organization, uh, we've consolidated our, our security departments in that organization a lot. That's a, that's a popular move in a lot of organizations. So in my department, we manage the physical security, the electronic key management systems, the cyber security, and the physical security. So we've, we've, we've created a synergy of that. I look forward to talking to you guys today. Uh, before that, I was 15 years at United States Pacific Command, serving in various positions from a systems manager, a developer, an information systems security manager at one point. We used to call it IEM. Now we've changed the name. Uh, and I look forward to talking to you today. 
All right, and uh, since just like last panel, I forgot to introduce myself. I just went right to my slides. Uh, I am Captain Jody Grady. I'm the Cybercom Liaison Officer to Pacific Command. So I, I sit at Pacific Command, but I work for Cybercom. So I, I work for Admiral Rogers, but I support uh, Rear Admiral Crichton, Admiral Harris, uh, and the Pacific Command staff. So Pacific Command thinks I'm a spy, and Cyber Command thinks I've gone native. So it's a, it's a good time. If you can make everybody equally unhappy, you have succeeded. So uh, we're going to start with our first question, uh, and uh, and I'll give a quick my own quick thought, and then I'll pass it on to uh, y'all. Uh, what do you see as the greatest cyber threat to the United States? In short, what keeps you awake at night in terms of cyber? And, and I can tell you, as a cybercom guy, it is connectivity for connectivity's sake. It is poorly planned or poorly thought out connections to the interwebs just because you can. Uh, from my military experience where everybody and their mom wants to put a camera on some system and then hook that camera into my satellite feeds so that somebody in the rear can see what I'm doing, to, to putting SCADA monitoring systems and then piping that data back to shore, uh, I always have to ask, what are we gaining by that? Why are we doing that? I'm not saying don't. But you need to have a reason to connect because every connection increases your attack surface. And that attack surface translates to risk. And uh, as, as people who run big responsible things like electrical companies, enormous communication centers, uh, National Security Agency, Critical Secrets, and, and Pacific Command equities, we're in the risk management business. You know, no risk, no reward. Too much risk and that's failure. Uh, so uh, if, 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 if I had one thing to say, if you're thinking about hooking something up to the interwebs, just take a deep breath and ask yourself, do you really, really want to do that? So Ross, over to you. Can we bring up uh, the last slide? Yeah. So uh, when Captain Grady sent out the questions, um, and I'm going to choose my words carefully here because I'm not native to the IT community. I'm a statistician. I'm also a morale welfare and recreation officer in my past life, and now I'm an energy guy. Um, but my biggest fear, what keeps me up at night, is the inability of this community, and I'm talking to you all, to recognize, understand, and respond to new and emerging threats like cybersecurity of critical energy infrastructure. And as an example, not to pick on Captain Grady, he's been a real champion here, but if you look through his slide presentation, You'll notice there's a lot of different uh, viruses that he pointed out and landmarks and everything. He didn't talk about the Aurora threat. He didn't have Stuxnet up there. He didn't have Black Energy virus. And worst of all, he didn't include what happened last year on 22 December 2015. Do you all know what that is? That was the attack on Ukraine by Russia took down the power grid, took out several hundred thousand people. And I know Brian knows that date, but the IT community is, um, is hard to adapt. Let's put it that way. So that's my one ask of you all is to take this threat seriously and embrace it and become champions of it. If you look at this slide, we showed this last year to um, a PACOM Northcom staff talk. So Admiral Harris our four-star admiral and Admiral Gortney from Northern Command. Um, and on the spot, they signed a letter to the Secretary of Defense saying, we need, we ask you, SecDef, to help us provide more um, support to solving this problem. Where's the problem? It's on that left side over there. There's a scorecard right now, and Mr. Halverson's gonna be here tomorrow from the DOD CIO office. He's in charge of the cyber scorecard. Control system cybersecurity is not on there. Control system, by the way, is things like electric grid, oil and gas pipelines, building management systems, water systems, HVAC, all that kind of stuff is managed by control systems. Um, the worst thing is, and, and Captain Grady pointed out, the authorities between DOD, DHS, and uh, uh, Department of uh, Energy, but within DOD, we don't have our own authorities worked out yet. The IT people say control system cybersecurity is not our game. We don't understand control systems, and that's not part of our core competency, right? 
The engineers, meanwhile, are saying, we don't know jack about cybersecurity. How can you expect us to fix this problem? So there needs to be a marriage of the minds between those two communities. And I will say this, the Navy is doing its best because they have IT specialists. They have a CIO office in each of their um, engineering commands ac across the country. So that's bullet number two is the ownership. Inventory. There is um, no understanding of what is in the DOD installations in the, in the way of control systems. How many different devices there are, what they are, what the vulnerabilities are. The Air Force says it'll take them 11 years to do that inventory. And as an example, um, if you look at that lower right bar graph, there's a building in DC, a relatively new building. It's about 10 years old, the Mark Center. It's sort of like a Pentagon um, off off the main Pentagon because everybody was leasing buildings in Roslyn and Crystal City, so they decided to build a government building to, to put everybody in there. There are 10,000 security devices in that building. There are 20,000 information system devices. There are 50,000 control system devices in that building. And there are no cyber controls to those cyber security controls to those 50,000 devices. Each of the installations in the DOD, like at Pearl Harbor, there's hundreds of control systems down there with thousands of devices. So imagine the, the need to go through that process and inventory them all. There's nobody that understands what normal network behavior is on those control system networks. Um, so they don't know what abnormal and normal behavior is and, and how to respond to it. Um, Cybercom, his uh, command, they did a thing called the joint, uh, J-Basics joint test, joint base architecture for securing industrial control systems, where they took people down to Sandia National Lab, they gave them two people, an IT and an engineer, look at these two control systems and tell us, where they want to figure out baselining metrics and build tactics, techniques, and procedures for detecting, um, mitigating, and recovering from a cyber attack. In this ideal environment, lab environment, these people were trained on IT or on the control systems. They were able only to detect 51% of the attacks in real time. So that's an issue, right? So there's no visualization tools out there. These TTPs were built. There's no one there to hand them off to. Um, and I will stop on that note. You can read the rest of that. There's uh, just a lot of issues. The, the tech refresh, that, but the big issue is once again, um, the understanding of the IT community. Mr. Halverson in 2014 built this pie chart, and that shows the IT budget. So it was about a year old. It was you know a summary of 2014 expenses. $39 billion was spent on IT in the DOD. Of that, about you know $10 billion was spent on cybersecurity, and that's the yellow wedge. There's a little itty bitsy teeny weeny white wedge in there of 0.00, .00 billion dollars spent on control system cybersecurity. So there you go. That's what keeps me up at night. So real quick in Cybercom's defense, it takes about a year to staff those slides that I showed you. <laughs> so I'll put an input into uh, Commander Holstead that we want to put those in, but you won't see it for at least a year. All right, over to Trevor. Thanks. Uh, so I'm sitting here trying to think, oh, what could I say different that, uh, that Captain Grady and, uh, and, and Ross hasn't already said? And I'd just like to yield my time back. I'm just joking. <laughs> um, uh, but no, actually just to expound a bit. Um, one thing that is, has become evident to me over the past couple of years, uh, and I don't know why it wasn't, uh, is the simple fact that if you connect something to the internet in any way, shape, or form, you've made it massively vulnerable. There's nothing that you can do to mitigate, to totally mitigate, to totally remove risk uh, by the fact that you've connected something to the internet. Someone will find a way. Um, and I apply that uh, in terms of what's, you know, what's the greatest threat, uh, uh, taking in terms of area, not necessarily actor. Um, uh, and I, I believe that's, that's, uh, that's industrial control systems. That's uh, what makes the, the civil, private, military, government, everything depends on that. Um, we would, we would uh, have significant difficulty uh, uh, doing anything as a country if, uh, if, if someone was to uh, uh, successfully exploit uh, so much of what is vulnerable in that space. Um, 
I don't know that I have much more to add than that. Hey, succinct is good. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. Dr. Runcher. So uh, what keeps me up at night is a little bit more uh, local to many of us who live here on the, uh, the island of Oahu. So I'll uh, tell a story a little bit uh, going back to around 2005, 2006, when cyber had finally entered the federal government lexicon and policy was starting to be created, kind of the precursors to the stand-up of cyber command and those sorts of things. And at the time, our director, General Keith Alexander, was warning of one day a cyber Pearl Harbor event. Now, it was a metaphor, and what he meant was some type of surprise attack for which we did not anticipate, we didn't have the defenses ready, and we did not have a recovery plan. It was really meant to be that kind of shock and awe of some type of, of attack that we were not ready for. Now, having lived on the island for almost a year and a half, I'm literally concerned about a cyber Pearl Harbor event. We are an isolated island. We don't have any backups for our critical infrastructure outside of what we have locally resident on each island. Um, we obviously are strategically important here in the Pacific, and PACOM has the largest AOR of any of the, the COCOMs. And so in terms of you know, uh, some type of threat that would involve a cyber event uh, being a projection of, of power, you could imagine this island in particular is strategically important to defend and protect. So while General Alexander meant that as, as a metaphor, I think we should look internally very carefully and interpret those words literally. It, there could be an event that affects us here locally, which is why it's so important that we all understand what it means to have cybersecurity uh, inculcated into our networks in, you know, in both um, government as well as state, local, and our industrial base. The other thing that, um, so I'm going to go through a couple of things, um, a couple of other examples that people haven't talked about. The other two concerns I have are the, um, the economic impacts of cyber. So a couple of studies I'll quote. In 2014, there was a study that indicated that data breaches cost U.S. companies an average of $195 per record lost or stolen by cyber criminals. And at that time, since many of the breaches involved thousands of records, the average cost per breach was almost $6 million. Now, if you're a small to medium-sized business, that could be a significant cost. But if you're a large business and you have millions of records, and we've seen it from Target to Home Depot and others, you're talking about damages on the order of 50 to hundreds of millions of dollars and growing. In addition, Gartner estimates the global loss from cyber crime this year could top $400 billion annually. That is a very large number. So economies of the world, including the United States, are impacted by these breaches, and we are all paying for it, whether we know it or not, because those costs are passed off to us as consumers in the goods we buy from those companies. In addition, those companies are being asked to buy cyber insurance policies, which are quite expensive, especially if you're buying a policy after you've already been attacked. So one of the policies was charging 25 cents for every dollar of liability that the insurance company was willing to provide to the uh, potential victim. That's almost completely un unaffordable if you think about it when you're talking about damages on the order of tens of millions of dollars. So I don't think we should just ignore, we just focus on industrial security. I think that's important and we're all talking about it, but also the economic damage that cyber attack uh, can, uh, can cause. The other example I would add into our discussion today is an, is an attack that was um, very successful. It occurred in August 15th of 2012 on one of the um, uh, world's oil, leading oil suppliers. That was Saudi Aramco. At the time, they supplied 10% of the world's oil supply, and they were hit with a cyber attack that partially or completely destroyed over 35,000 computers. And the, the interesting thing about this attack, uh, it's largely believed that this was motivated and organized by you know, nation states. So this is a very serious attack. The attack was likely launched through a spear phishing email. Just an employee happening to open up an attachment right, that contained malware that provided the attackers with access to the business side of the corporate network. And from there, the attackers could move laterally throughout that infrastructure. I think what's interesting is Saudi Aramco did a decent job 
walling off their oil processing facilities from their business network. So the attackers did not reach into their SCADA network. They did not you know, get a hold of the refinery systems and the, the pipelines and that sort of thing. However, the, the attack was still catastrophic. And I think that's important to recognize. Just because they're in the business network doesn't mean they can't wreak havoc and cause major damage. So as an example, the malware, once it was unleashed and, and triggered, deleted files and destroyed hard drives throughout the company in a matter of hours. So this was an attack that progressed over the period of weeks or, or, or even days. In a matter of hours, the entire business IT system was completely crippled and irrecoverable. The network was sufficiently isolated, as I said, so the SCADA systems were not breached, but the company had to revert to paper tracking of all their transactions. They had to go back to typewriters and fax machines to process orders, and this slowed their processing of oil shipments to a crawl. There were miles of gasoline tanker trucks in need of refills, that, and the company couldn't process payment because it was all electronic. It took them five months to recover from this attack, and a couple of the effects First of all, they realized that trying to clean off the malware from all of the, the computers was a futile exercise, so they decided to reboot from scratch. They flew private jets to hard drive manufacturers in Southeast Asia and literally cornered the market in hard drives. They purchased 50,000 brand new hard drives, brought them back into the company to restart their IT systems. And here's an interesting fact that many of us don't, didn't know at the time. If any of you purchased a hard drive between September 2012 in January 2013, you actually paid a slightly higher price because the, the worldwide supply had dwindled because of this massive scale purchase by Saudi Aramco. And so overall, it took them five months to recover. So even though we have isolation or we attempt isolation between the SCADA networks and the industrial controls and the business side, we should not underestimate the importance and the reliance we all have on just those daily communications that we need to make the businesses that we depend on run in the critical infrastructure sector. So I'm just as concerned about the SCADA systems as I am the business and IT systems because they're just as vulnerable. In some sense, they're even more vulnerable because they're often connected to the internet to handle these types of transactions, and they're just as critical to make sure that we're defending those to keep the businesses up and running and reliable as we expect them. So I think there's a lot of lessons learned, even from these previous events, that are worth reviewing if you're an IT professional to understand not only what could be vulnerable, how it might impact you, but what is your recovery plan? You know, Saudi Aramco never thought they'd have to replace 50,000 hard drives, so they didn't have a stash of these on hand, or they didn't have a backup that was already on standby, ready to go to, to restart their systems. So when it comes to a cyber Pearl Harbor event, I do hope we can detect it before it occurs. If you know the history of Pearl Harbor, you know there was a chance that those few blips on that radar station, if they had been interpreted differently, would have altered the course of history. And so sometimes it pays to be paranoid. If you see something strange, you might think it might be the precursor or the beginning of a cyber event, not just a blip on a screen or an unusual or abnormal event caused by the weather, right? These are things that we need to start to think about. Could it be a cyber attack? Could this be the beginning of something? Should we look at our logs? Should we notify the IT and security personnel to look into it? And the second piece is when we are attacked because attacks are occurring all the time, what is our recovery plan? Right, move from the initial uh, shock of the attack to let's go to recovery mode and let's institute a recovery to bring our systems back up online as quickly as possible and then worry about the forensics and some of the other things that are, that are to follow. Too often, the shock of the attack paralyzes organizations and they cannot recover quick enough to bring those critical systems back online. So those are some of the things I'm concerned about and I think there's lots of lessons from history that we can all study and, uh, and learn from. All right, thank you. Trevor, can I get the controls? Yep, yep I'll pass the click for Brian. Get the uh, PowerPoint up, please. Thank you. Uh, a couple quick notes on that. Uh, the, uh, I think insurance will probably go ahead and, and drive the industry, actually. Some of these policies you're talking about have $25 million deductibles on them, and they're capped at $100 million now, too, which is uh, pretty extraordinary. Um, and one of my fears, I think, I just realized is uh, on a future panel, I will always want to sit to the right of Dr. Runzer instead of to his <laughs> left. So um, what I do want to go through, though, and what I'd like to 
to talk about is we talk about we've got great separation and, and segmentation between our IT and OT networks. And it's, it's not as easy to do when you start talking about inventory controls. You know, you, you, you try to go ahead and get a handle of all this, but when you're talking about thousands of endpoints and, and, and thousands of users, it's a little difficult. You know, you see the number of shoes every day in your closet. Do you know how many shoes you got in your closet? Okay. We internet, our internet, our outward facing firewalls is the same type of thing. People can plug things in, all of a sudden you're connected in. And it's very difficult to stay ahead of that. What I'd like to do in these is I would like to go through and tell you my frame of reference a little bit here and, and tell you why maybe that's not part of reality. Because our frame of reference for this is, and as Commander Bean from the NSA was here uh, previously and, and stated that, you know, if you want to go ahead and try to soften up the agencies that are sitting up here, you try to knock out the power. The director of the FBI has stated specifically, you know, on 60 Minutes, that you've got two types of companies, you know, those that have been hacked by the Chinese and know it, and those that have been hacked by the Chinese and don't know it. The same thing. Head of the uh, NSA has the same thing. You've got all these companies that have gone into the, uh, the, uh, the, the utility, and this is actually very prophetic, because this was made to Congress, and it was before the Ukrainian attack, where it knocked out multiple substations and you know 200,000 people were without power so you this is the frame of reference is what they're telling the public on now if you look at there's a report that was kicked out by Mandian this year their M trends is you look at that and it's one of the graphs in this is really quite extraordinary because if you look at this graph and it's quite telling the average days to detection from someone being breached is 156 days. Now that's 100, excuse, 146 days, 146, that's the average. For those companies that did not discover it themselves, that number was 320 days. And it's gone down significantly. They're, they're, it's gone down, it was over 50 days. Several years ago, it was, it was higher than that. And even for those companies that have a you know, very you know, layered security, a lot of different things going on with that, which we try to pride ourselves in, the time for discovery on that was 40, was 56 days, excuse me, it's 56, that's almost two months that someone's in your system. Now it's interesting to note, about 53% of these companies that did, and this is crossing thousands of companies, had to be told by external agencies, there's someone in your system. It's, we'll come back to this. The, you would think on this, that the, and you, this is from the world's biggest data breaches, that the number of companies that are out there being breached, you think, my gosh, these are all, you know, no, they don't have good security. They just haven't instituted the right things. This is showing here, the ones in purple actually there, kind of pinkish, are the companies that got hacked into. And if you take a look just at those red ones, actually, those are the red ones that they said, those companies, those are the only companies that didn't have good security. So it means if you go back to the other one, all those companies had adequate security in here. These are the ones that were hacked. So if we go back again to this, to our, to this graph here, which I think is very telling, if you're the CISO or the CIO and you're reporting to the you know, chief financial officer or CEO and you're saying, you know, I'm going to try to go ahead and give my guys a bonus this year, boss, because you know what? We didn't have anybody come in, any outside agencies tell us we'd been hacked. And in fact, the ones that we did discover, we discovered it about 30 days once they'd been in our system. And that's okay because that's half, that's half of the time frame of most companies. So we're doing a fantastic job. We're better than 80% of all the companies out there. In what frame of reality is that you know, possible, okay? How is it possible that you can't have security and, and we think this is acceptable? If people are going to go ahead and access your system, they're going to go ahead and start exfiltrating data, all your PII and everything almost immediately when they get in, and they're going to put other hooks in there to try to get back into your system. You have to be able to detect and contain that as rapidly as possible. You're talking within hours. You're not talking days. And I see a huge disconnect, actually between the things that you're able to potentially commercially buy and the discovery of a lot of these, the malware on systems. Now, what can be done about that? I think that what we've seen is, and what we try to do, is we have a good visibility and a good window because of the relationship we have with the Hawaii State Fusion Center. It gives us access to data that's at a classified level. 
that we can be able to make a determination on advanced threat intelligence. So we can work with agencies, DHS, FBI, and other agencies you see here, to be able to make a determination about people trying to access our system so we can go ahead and strategically determine how we're going to go ahead and utilize the resources, people, and money that we have to secure our systems. You have J.P. Morgan Chase has a budget of about $250 million in 2014. They doubled that security budget to $500 million the following year when they got hacked. I can absolutely assure you my budget is much smaller than that, okay? <laughs> You know, the four largest banks, actually, you've got, you know, uh, J.P. Morgan, you've got Bank of America, you've got Wells Fargo and Citibank, they're going to spend a billion and a half dollars on cybersecurity this year. But yet you still see some of them, you know, losing records and all. So I think you almost, what I... And very much proponent of, and we've gotten some good visibility because, as you're uh, well aware, we were under uh, due diligence for Next Era uh, merger with Next Era Florida Power and Light, and because we were going to be connecting our systems with theirs, and they run some nuclear power plants, we did an amazing amount of due diligence for cybersecurity, and because of that, it allowed us good visibility on certain things. But yet, I don't see the indicators that are necessary to be able to discover the malware to reduce this time frame being probably pushed out as rapidly as possible. Now I have seen a huge frame, a huge change in that in the last few years, which is beneficial. But it's got to be more robust actually, especially to those critical infrastructures, I think, to be able to to strategically, you know, move forward and, and secure the systems. So thank you. Thank you. Try to follow all of them. <laughs> so what keeps me up at night? I'm going to go a lot more local. Uh, I was thinking about my family because I was thinking of a lot of things that were said here today. But I, there, I have, it's basically I'm thinking of a stool. And, th and that stool, there are three things on that stool that really work together to give me uneasiness. Uh, the first is our public life is out there between my Facebook and, and, and Twitter and, and where we are and my, my, my wife. You know, she's, I'm, I'm at the, I'm at the, Tony Romas today, or I'm here. I mean, we're, I'm, I'm sure we're all being tracked, even if I'm not. The amount of information we can pull for anyone on this panel, in this room, it scares me. That's, that's number one. And number two, the sophistication to take that information from, the, from an adversary and use it against you is, is incredible. We, we in DOD, we do cyber awareness training. We do training, training, training all the time. And, 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 and you did, uh, Trevor's team did a test. They sent an email out during an exercise, 100 people, well-trained individuals, know what to do with, a, with an email. It, not, like 90% hit rate, opened the email from senior leaders. And so, but the sophistication, it's easy. That's what scares me. My mom's going to get an email for a FedEx package, and they got her. And then the third, so, so that's the first thing. First is, is is that the, uh, lost my train of thought. Oh, the, the third one, the ease to put that malware in a delivery package is incredibly easy. That, that, that scares me, that, that there's no antivirus that's gonna stop it. You get a, you get a unique code, you, I know I wanna hit you, I can hit you. you know? So that, 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 that's what scares me. The, 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 our, our public life is out there for the intel gathering, and I like that comment about the, either the people who know the Chinese have it or they don't, that's, that's, that's probably relevant. And, and that you can turn malware so easily and attack those persons with just a few pieces of their life, and you got them. And I don't know how to protect my family, I don't know how to protect my children on that. I guess we can disconnect from the internet, but the millennials are not liking that idea. You're well, well, really well connected. So anyway, that's what keeps me up at night, that, that stool that falls over all the time. All right. Thank you. Awesome answers from everybody. And then if you're wondering how to get someone to click on spear phishing, just say it's parking policy. Everybody clicks on the email about parking. So I don't know if you've been up to Camp Smith, but it's, uh, it's nightmarish. Okay, so next question, and I understand, I want to rephrase it just a little bit from what I gave you guys advance, is what policies or mitigations do you think are needed to improve cybersecurity in the United States, understanding that not everybody up here can... Uh, comment on policy. And so lesson learned from last panels, I kept hitting the same person over and over again first. So Ross, you went first last time. So Trevor, you're up first. Right. What policies or mitigations do you think are needed to improve cybersecurity in the US? So now I can say the one thing that everybody else is just going to copy. No, that's not the case. 
Um, so I, I guess this is a question where I'll kind of let loose on, on uh, the, my area of focus. Um, cybersecurity, first, cybersecurity in the DoD is a, is a term that was, uh, uh, we transitioned to that from information assurance. Um, that's that's the basically the practice of everyday hygiene, patching, uh, having good uh, good security practices, um, and 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 I don't want to downplay the the importance of that. That 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 is foundational. We cannot stop doing that. It's like saying we we don't need antivirus anymore. No, we do. We just need other things, and we leverage them together. Um, we also have an area, which uh, hopefully most people are aware, right? Uh, defensive cyber operations. So basically the difference between cybersecurity and cyber defense. Um, cyber defense, uh, we're, still, we're still maturing our approach, but, but essentially it's, it's one of, a, of risk management. Um, and, and to do that, uh, we, have to, we have to know ourselves. Uh, because so, so with cybersecurity, we, can, we can't defend everything. Uh, we have to defend the things that are most important. So uh, what we, in terms of policy practice, uh, that I think is important for everyone is, is again, to, to know yourself. Um, we do that by analyzing our mission, maybe your business, um, identifying what are those critical capabilities that, that you must have in order to support your business or mission. Um, and then look at those, uh, those architectures, whatever they are, uh, could be could be basic information systems, could be control systems, could be could be anything, um, and you have to look at them from from an adversarial view. You have to look at how uh, how could that be exploited in some way to interrupt your business, to to complicate your operation, um, and and through that analysis, you can you can hopefully then prioritize your action. Um, you assess you assess these things um, where you can remediate vulnerabilities. You do you, you know fixing problems. That's our first impulse. Is you see a problem, you want to fix it. Well, you you fix what you can, and then you have to de develop mitigations. You have to develop ways to mitigate the risk for those things that you simply cannot fix. Maybe you need to change the way that you do your business. Uh, it could be could be something subtle that gives you a great a great benefit. <clears throat> And then, uh, and then finally, monitoring smartly. Um, it's that, that's something that uh, that that I, we still struggle with every day. It's the I like to uh, uh, use the metaphor of the jingling keys. I don't have any keys keys ready, but right. There's always something that 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 happens that's really interesting and distracting. It could be it could be a very interesting um, exploit. Could be a very interesting technique. Uh, could be something that you weren't expecting. Um, but you have, to, you have to look objectively at, is that event something that you're gonna drop everything and, and, and full court press on trying, to, on trying to figure out? Or do you put that aside, you know, do, do what you need to do to, to clean it up, but, but focus on, on, on those things that, that really gonna cost you money, you, you know, gonna cost money, gonna cost lives, gonna cost your uh, um, you know, continuity of government, uh, things like this. Um, so I think in terms of, uh, back to the question, in terms of policies, um, uh, this, 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 uh, people have been saying this for a long time, compliance versus security. Compliance versus defense, I'd say. Um, we have to do compliance, but, but uh, you cannot lose sight of uh, the need to uh, understand yourself and be able to prioritize smartly. Dr. Roger. So defending um, cyberspace is really everyone's responsibility. This goes back to creating a culture of cybersecurity. Um, perhaps the best analogy is, you know, when you leave the house, you lock the door, right? You lock your car when you're not in it, and you would never go to work and leave, leave the doors at work wide open if you're the last one in the building. Um, somehow we need to educate our workforce about all the different ways in which they are targeted by cyber attackers because they're the frontline defense. Right, signatures are only as good as, you know, after the first few folks have already been succumbed by the attack. You know, we've got to educate the workforce to be suspicious about things that, um, you know, come in through the email and, and those sorts of things. And one of the things that concerns me the most, and this falls into the mitigations arena, is trying to separate our personal lives from our corporate or government lives. And it's so hard to do because they're so intermingled, they're so intertwined, we're so interdependent. But oftentimes, it's checking that personal email or that social 
you know, networking website at work or taking work information, working on it at home in a more vulnerable network, it's the boundaries and seams between those networks that are most vulnerable and allow an attacker to come in. So somehow compartmentalizing that information, right, and ensuring that people who have access to sensitive networks or sensitive information, you know, operate them that way. Perhaps a separate enclave within your company to go check personal email that's completely separate from the business side of the network, right? Just literally creating that physical separation sometimes makes people think differently, right? Now I'm doing personal things on a different area, right? So when I'm on the corporate network, my behavior, you know, I'm more on guard, I'm, I'm, I'm more careful. But I do worry about the blending of our lives between these two different uh, worlds is essentially what's providing a broader attack surface uh, for those who want to gain access to those networks or that information. I think some of the things Trevor talked about, of course, are very important, keeping those systems up to date. One thing I will put in a plug-in for is that NSA has a program called the Commercial Solutions for Classified, and it was started uh, many years ago by our Information Assurance Directorate to uh, route folks in, in the federal government to uh, vendors and integrators who actually sold commercial equipment, it wasn't GOTS equipment, commercial equipment that could carry the most sensitive government information at the highest classification levels. Well, those solutions and those packages are available essentially to anyone. You can go to the NSA.gov webpage, you can learn about the different systems, right, the different applications and packages that have been put together, whether it's for mobile IT security or for uh, your business enclave and those sorts of things, and, and even you know, go so far as to purchasing those systems and perhaps even hiring an integrator to put those systems online uh, within your company or organization. So um, as much as we can, we try to publicize the lessons we have learned from many years of defending these networks, and we make those available uh, as much as we can on our website. And the final piece is sharing, and uh, all of us have talked about this, sharing cybersecurity information at the speed of, of networks. Um, I'm very hopeful the new Cyber Information Security Act, which was signed at the closing of 2015 by the president, will open up more opportunities for state and local uh, government agencies, fusion centers, as well as industries, critical infrastructure providers, to share information and threat indicators with the federal government and vice versa. I know my agency is very active. Whenever we see a threat on DOD infrastructure, we push out those threat indicators to the domestic agencies, FBI, DHS, which lands in U.S. certain other places to get that information disseminated as quickly as possible. The new CISA Act actually provides even more services that businesses can sign up for, subscribe to, and forms they can participate in that allows them to access those threat indicators at wire speed. And so the more we can, we can influence those programs, the more users of those programs we can get online, the better they can actually serve the interests of our critical infrastructure providers and, as well as our uh, local communities. So the federal government's there to help, but again, uh, we need input from industry to make sure that these systems that are being set up are as useful as, as uh, they need to be to defend the networks. Yeah, I'm going to actually mirror that. Uh, the uh, cybersecurity uh, executive order was uh, 13691, which uh, promoted uh, the establishment of the information sharing and analysis organizations is huge. And we are very fortunate here because the agencies are all working with the private sector. You've got the electrical company, the board of water supply, you're dealing with several other critical infrastructures are trying to sign MOU. And the visibility we get from the DHS, FBI, NSA on these is, is unparalleled except in a couple of other states. Uh, it's nice to see that type of traction, and that's really where I think things have to evolve to, is you have to be able to get together with these other groups. And we share information with several other, other power companies, actually, on the mainland. And the indicators we see, we're kind of an equal opportunity uh, energy company, because you can name any country in the world, and they're trying to get, to get into my systems, okay? And uh, they're trying to do that, actually. They can list a vulnerability online, and we see people pinging the system on that within hours, literally. So we are very very careful on, on a lot of the things we're doing, but to really focus
emphasis on the things that are necessary, it's important that we get this type of information and that we can uh, co collaborate that with other companies because we see about a 35% uh, correlation between other companies, between people trying to access uh, things. And, and typically you're talking uh, the things that are of great concern to us are foreign nation st state threats. Uh, those are the things that are, are, are really problematic with the advanced persistent threats. So we're constantly on guard and watching that and increasing our network visibility. But I think that in itself, that information sharing advisory uh, uh, analysis uh, group is able to really kind of uh, to move that forward because it makes a lot more sense. If I know this group has, I've, I've, I've got an uptick of phishing from this type of thing this week and the water company is seeing it and the, you know, maybe Hawaiian Airlines is seeing it, maybe a couple of the hospitals or a couple of the banks, all of a sudden that's a huge rise that we didn't see maybe last month. Something's going on and it helps us correlate that and say, hey, maybe we need to take a little bit more of a look at this and really kind of drill down into it. So. I was reflecting on this one and I was thinking about uh, communications we have in our personal life. Uh, there's a common theme here, but I was thinking about like when I file my taxes. I was thinking about when I'm doing a, uh, you know, closing on a property or something like that. And I, it made me think about, you know, a national policy of, of, you know, like a national, I was thinking of a national digital ID system of some sort where you can start having, you can start authorizing and authenticating people nationwide. And so if I could change a policy, if I could be king of the day and, and be president, I, I, I would institute a national ID system and then we can start creating a culture where we start having uh, verified access when we're doing our business communications, when we're buying stuff from Amazon, when we're sending a letter to mom or dad and stuff. And I would, I would start harkening that thing. And it took, it took the de Defense Department, what, 15 years now and we're still just now getting some of our systems on, on this kind of credentialed uh, two-factor authentication model. Uh, and if, if you have a business that, does, that is directly connected to the internet, I, that's, 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 a, that's a problem. I know we need to conduct business there, that's where our vendors are, but there, that, that idea of separation is, 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 is key, because if you got in, there's a way in. Within minutes, uh, uh, they're pinging you, because that's, that's how good the tool sets are now. All right, let me address policy first, and it was in my slide, uh, number two is just the, the basic policy of ownership. And let me give you a couple of examples. Um, last year in the National Defense Authorization Act, there was a directive for the U.S. Navy to conduct an, a control system cybersecurity vulnerability assessment in the PACOM AOR for Pacific Command. That hasn't started yet because no one in the, in the Pentagon knows who's responsible for launching that. Um, you were joking about the, the year it takes to get your slides uh, approved. That letter we sent to the Secretary of Defense was mailed on 11 February 2016, nine months ago. It was assigned to Mr. Halverson, the DOD CIO. We have yet to receive a reply yet. He's trying to pull together who's responsible for all these things. Um, they, so it's not just at the Pentagon, but it's also within Pacific Command. Is it a J4 or J6 responsibility? I'm in the J8. I'd like to not think it's my long-term responsibility, but I'm taking the lead on it now. And then at the installation level, um, there, there's just a lot of issues, and that's a fundamental thing that needs to get worked out before we can solve the bigger problem. So mitigation. Let me talk about some of the mitigation strategies that were already discussed and um, Mention how that may be well and good for IT systems, but not necessarily for control systems. Connection to the internet, right? Stuxnet, everyone thinks if it's air-gapped, it's safe. In control systems, not so much. Stuxnet proved that you can um, take a, uh, a device, you know, a thumb drive, and uh, propagate malicious malware that way. And that's, that brought down the entire Iranian uh, centrifuge system for their reactors. reactors. There is, um, enclaving is great. It's gotta be a defense in depth architecture, it has to be. So it has to include enclaving and whitelisting and encryption and so many other things. Dental, hy I mean not dental, <laughs> cyber hygiene <laughs> included. But I will say this, there's a growing um, feeling in the control system world that patch management is not that important. And I'll give you an example. 
Brian Tepper, when he gets a patch on one of his critical uh, energy management systems, he can't just throw that thing on overnight and let it run. They need to test it out for months and months to make sure that it's going to work on their system of systems that controls this entire grid. So by the time they get around to uh, installing a patch, it's already OBE. And it's too hard to keep up with. If these guys spent uh, all their working hours on patch management, they wouldn't have time to do anything else within cyber hygiene. So the key, and it's one of my other bullets on here, uh, mission mapping on installations. Instead of doing patch management, we need to understand what critical control systems most affect the mission that they're supporting. And I'll give you an example of that. At Camp Smith, we have a microgrid that was built by the Spiders JCTD. On, uh, I think it was about 15 January last year, we asked Hawaiian Electric Company to turn off the power to the camp so we could do our big operational demonstration. The Spiders microgrid would take up the entire load on the camp. It did, it worked great. However, there's a place down at Pearl Harbor, Station C, that has the HMI that controls the Spiders microgrid. And when the lights went out, at, when the power was cut at Camp Smith, they had no visibility of the microgrid uh, from Pearl Harbor. After further investigation, we realized, okay, the fiber network routes through our fire station and then takes a lease line down to Pearl Harbor. There's no un 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 ups, uninterruptible power supply at the fire station. So until the spider's microgrid, after three or four minutes, took on the load, they had no visibility. We don't know what critical systems most affect the mission. It could be your HVAC in uh, PACOM headquarters because if the HVAC goes out, then the um, heat goes way up and you can't run your, con your uh, computer systems. It could be something as simple as a thermostat. Um, one of the documented cases in, in DOD is, actually it's not, it's a federal government, but there was a thermostat that was digitally reprogrammed to be a microphone, a listening device in a, in a high profile conference room. It, it's a scary thing, but these are the kind of examples of things. So it's got to be a defense in depth, starting with mission mapping and including, I mean, cyber hygiene is great. Um, Captain Grady talked about spear phishing. That's how the Ukraine attack started. Someone, it wasn't parking. Someone uh, from Russia sent out an Excel spreadsheet to the president of the Ukraine uh, or to the leadership in the Ukraine um, utility system and had check out where uh, troops are being deployed, Ukrainian troops. And this one guy has a son in the Ukrainian army. So damn sure he's going to open that up to find out where his son is serving right now. And that launched the whole thing. They used black energy. They used the Metasploit session. They gained um, control of the HMI by um, receiving valid credentials. And the operator at the Ukraine power plant lost control of the computer. All of a sudden, it, the mouse started, or the cursor started moving around and clicking on things. He couldn't do anything about it. Started shutting down uh, pieces of the electric grid. So what did he do? The only thing he could, he pulled out his iPhone and took a video of his screen acting autonomously, remotely from some cyber hacker. So it's a scary world, but uh, those are the two things for me. Policy within the DOD on ownership, and then uh, defense in depth, start, starting with mission mapping for mitigation. Thanks, Ross. Uh, real quick for me, uh, I'm very interested in, in, in HECO's health, and I'm very interested in, in uh, critical uh, infrastructure key resources so my one big policy change is I think the policy is out there to do what I'm saying but it's not clear I want I would like a clear concisely written policy that has appendices of exact procedures to follow that allows the authorities that DHS has to help people like Brian be resourced by the the the, the cyber protection teams that we in DOD have and not to do it after an incident. I think we all know what to do. If the, if, the, if the sky starts falling, we know what to do. But that's too late. 
Uh, it takes about three days. Uh, any of you who've had an intrusion, and you don't have to raise your hands because I know nobody wants to talk about that. If you bring in the pros from Dover, you, know, you bring in the FireEye guys, the Mandate guys, or you bring in Navy cyber protection teams, it's the same thing. It's about three days to observe, orient, decide before you can act. So if they know your network beforehand, they can act quick. So I would like a concisely written policy with procedures of how we could get DOD CPTs working with Department of Homeland Security to, to be able to be legally allowed to cooperate with people like Brian so that we know their networks and we get to, and we get to see that without messing up their lives. I mean, they've got customer data, they've got financial data that is none of the government's business. And, and we have to find a way to protect that while still helping to protect them because the lights go out, we're all having a bad day. So that'd be the one policy change I'd make. So real quick, before I go to question three, we're at the one hour mark, and I want to see if we have any questions from the audience before I move on. You have one? Uh, post it up, please. We'll hit an audience question real quick. Are you working with Japan for cybersecurity during the upcoming Olympics? Anybody over here even able to talk about that? So, so I'll, um, I'll say something that um, as the intelligence community just broadly, right, we always um, uh, have the interest of our athletes, right, and any U.S. persons who are traveling overseas, especially for a large international event like the Olympics. So the intelligence community is very much a part of defending any U.S. asset, right, or large amounts of U.S. persons who are overseas. And a high-profile event, you can bet that the intelligence community is is there, is present, is trying to ensure the safety of our citizens. Um, and that's about all I can say. From, a, from Cybercom, I can say that we constantly work with our allies, whether it's the Five Eye Partners, NATO, or Japan, to work out what we are willing to share with each other. And of course, it always has to be a two-way street. Uh, why do I say that? Because it's a constant negotiation. You know, what am I willing to share with, with Five Eyes? What am I willing to share with NATO? Well, I'm willing to share with Japan. And they've got to be able to share that same stuff back. Uh, so uh, would we be willing to work with each other? I'm sure. At what level? At what level of detail? Uh, Japan's, uh, I've worked with Japanese ships at sea my entire career. They're a very, very capable military force. And I'm sure they are very, very capable cybersecurity force as well. So it would be a question of how much support would they want and how much sharing would be willing to do. And, and whether or not in the end, and at the end of time, we would tell the public how much sharing we've done, I, I don't know, because it depends on the type of sharing we'd be doing, if that makes sense. If it's a lot of Dr. Runcer stuff, you're probably not going to hear about it. But if it's a lot of uh, DOD cyber protection teams running around helping with stuff, you would hear about that. That'd be in the papers. Does that, does that help? Yeah, real quickly, um, this Unified Cause Grid Resiliency Project that we're launching, we plan to do a demonstration project not for Tokyo Olympics, but for the Asian Games in, I think it's in Singapore in 2018. Do, have any more, uh, do we have any more audience questions? We do. Next one. It's a long one. I'll let you guys read it for a second. What is your reaction to the comment? The government needs to reduce the classification of much of their cyber threat information to help build better awareness and better educate industry in the civil sector. They can still protect sources and methods. So before I turn that over to, I think just about everybody up here is going to have a comment on that. Uh, me personally, so I spend half my life on NSA net reading NSA stuff. I spend the other half of my life on Cypernet reading PACOM stuff. And I have to constantly struggle even to go from the signals intelligence type information to Cypernet to make that tear line. So what you're talking about is remove the sources and methods, just give me what's going on and pass it to me. So what's hard about that is because the details of what you found are in, can be indicative of your sources and methods. So it's not as simple as the tear line on the movies. Take Bob's name off there and send him the telegram. Nope. You know, the fact that you know who Bob is might tell you, you know, how you got there. But uh, that being said, I will turn it over to, I think it's Dr. Runcher's turn to go first, or whose turn is it to go first? Who wants it? Who wants the answer? Uh, I was, I was Trevor, go for it. So uh, this is not quite an answer, but it's uh, somewhat to 
I guess turn the question, I guess, uh, back back on industry a bit. Um, uh, Brian mentioned the the executive order uh, establishing and, and uh, encouraging formation of information sharing uh, analysis organizations. Um, I, I, I feel like uh, there is just as much or more benefit in, in the sharing of, of uh, information across industry. Um, if, if we can get to the point where we're attracting participants to these organizations uh, while providing uh, protection of their sensitive information, um, you, you certainly could build uh, an intelligence capability um, uh, that is uh, uh, s certainly certainly powerful. I, I can't compare it to the uh, you know to the to the intelligence uh, capability of, of the United States as a, as a country, um, but uh, I, I feel like that is that is an area ripe uh, ripe to to tap um, that in in cases where we cannot we cannot cleanse information. Uh, you, you can you can say you can still protect sources methods. Hmm, maybe not. Um, it's, it's not impossible, but it, for me anyway, it's a daily struggle trying to do disclosure. Yeah, yeah. But uh, but I, I think uh, I think it is a it's an opportunity to highlight um, where we have uh, there there are sources of intelligence other than the government that that has great that could have great benefit uh, to the nation. So I'm interested to hear from NSA and former FBI on this, especially. Yeah. So I, I would first say that we already have mechanisms for for doing this if we perceive that the the threat that um, or vulnerability we've discovered is of grave danger, right? There are direct links, right, between our agency, DHS, FBI, and the state and local, you know, fusion centers to push that information out at the lowest classification level possible, which is often unclassified, right, if it has to be put on to a private sector type system. Uh, the other thing is there's an equities review process that's takes place for any vulnerability, whether the intelligence community uncovers it or it's uh, some vulnerability we learn through some type of sensitive um, uh, intelligence we've collected. That vulnerability is reviewed among multiple government agencies who get to weigh in and make a decision. It's not NSA's decision, it's the federal government's decision whether to release that information to the vendor to patch the system. And you have to re understand that that information has to be put out in a very methodical manner. If you came out publicly with it, you might give the attackers a window in which to take advantage of all of those vulnerable systems. Um, you also need to have a relationship with the vendor. Suppose the vulnerability discovered is a foreign manufacturer. How do you approach that manufacturer to uh, get them the information to tell them that their system is vulnerable? So there's a lot more nuances, right, than just over classification when it comes to some of these issues. And I can tell you that the men and women who work for the National Security Agency have the defense of the nation and, and of our Constitution as our primary goal. So I can tell you I've been in many conversations where the defense generally wins the argument if critical U.S. Citizens, uh, systems or uh, critical internet systems are at risk, we get that information out through the, the agencies that have the domestic authorities to publish that information to the sectors that are affected. All right. Um. Testing. I've got, uh, I'm very opinionated on this, obviously, and I think you can maybe take it and spin it a little bit at 180 degrees, too, because I think uh, in the last two years, and since I've left the FBI about three years ago, I've seen a huge increase in the information flow that's coming from, you know, the uh, intelligence agencies, the FBI, DHS, and NSA, actually, to push those indicators, to declassify those, to push them out. I think that they could be more robust in this, but there has been a change in that, which is, uh, which is very beneficial. I think to twist it, though, what you can say is I think more clearances are necessary in a lot of the critical infrastructures. You don't have to tell the entire company what the threat indicator is, and you don't have to, to tell them the attributes. However, but you do need to allow them to understand what that threat is. Keep in mind when you're looking at some of the classified information, an IP address can be considered classified when you're looking at some of these indicators. So I can't take that information back and disclose it to anybody or even do searches on that specific IP address. It's very, very restrictive if I see something with that going on. So you've got to, but knowing what that is, I can look at that and I can do certain things with it that I can't, you know, I, I won't get into that. but. 
you can do certain things with it to go ahead and strategize and make sure we're protected against it. And I am briefed in at that level, and I've got several of my analysts that are too, but not everybody across the board is, so we can help strategize. So I think you can twist it that way and get the benefit. And it, it leads back. I do think, though, this is beneficial, and it needs to, to be more robust, but it is moving the, the right, dis right direction. You guys had it. I've got it. Common. I've lived this uh, through the spiders JCTD. I've written two security classification guides, one for spiders, one for this project with HECO. And the tendency in the DOD is to overclassify. People liked it. And I, you know, I'm 40 years now in the military. And until I wrote that first security classification guide, I didn't realize what all those classifications meant. People want to slap FOUO on anything that they don't want to disclose. Well, there's really strict rules on what should and shouldn't be FOUO. Same thing for uh, confidential, secret, top secret. In our JCTD, in the, in the Spiders Microgrid project, we had some cyber vulnerabilities that we found through red teaming. Um, our leadership at the Pentagon wanted to make it all secret, but there was no direct link according to the, the rules of what makes a classified uh, secret document, there's no link to the mission there. So um, we went back and forth, back and forth, and I finally compromised there and said, whatever, in order to keep the project moving, I will, you know, I'll mark this whatever you want, <laughs> but I'm telling you, it's not supposed to be classified. So I've seen this, and I would say um, uh, we struggled a little bit with the same thing with Hawaiian Electric Company in the opposite direction. They are very, um, and we worked this out. Brian and I worked it out, so it's, it's all good fun now. But uh, <laughs> they are very protective of their information, as they should be. And they wanted to mark things classified. However, uh, classified secret. However, they don't have people with <laughs> secret um, clearances they don't have secret facilities for storage. They don't have this, that, and the other thing. So we really had to work through that process to come up to a compromised position where uh, our security classification guide met both um, objectives of the DOD and the utility. Well, everybody's looking brighter-eyed out there now we're taking your questions. So we're just going to – I had two more, but I think we've answered one of them. And the other one uh, – the last one, we don't matter. Next, <laughs> next audience question. Which is more dangerous, A, an attack in an information system, or B, an attack on an industrial control system? I'll answer this one, I, I think. Um, information system usually does not have kinetic effects. An industrial control system can have kinetic effects. And there's a guy, Dr. Joe Weiss, who has been logging cyber incidents with kinetic effects, and he's got a list of over 900 of these things. One of them is in my hometown of Bellingham, Washington. You can look it up about 10, 15 years ago. There was a pipeline there where uh, a valve was uh, inadvertently left open, and it caused a leak, and it was um, some kids were fishing there, lit a match, and boom, the whole, the whole riverbed, the Whatcom Creek, went up in smoke and it caused a mushroom cloud you could see for uh, miles and miles away. So there, and three, three kids died in that one. I don't see a, an information system causing that kind of damage. That's just me. So Trevor hit it, it's, it's nothing, nothing against what Ross said, but Trevor hit it, it's C, it depends. So a situation like Ross said, that's obviously deadly, but remember an industrial control system is also burglar alarms. So there's places where script kitties have hacked Control systems just set off burglar alarms. Annoying, yes. Deadly, no. However, if the information system that you hacked is maybe a shared system between us and the Iraqis to help their troops get into Mosul right now, and it gives away their positions so that ISIL can use the artillery they've stolen from us to hit them, that's pretty darn deadly. So this is a clearly, it depends. Uh, if you were to attack the industrial Hico, uh, control system of HECO, which is well protected, by the way, I got total faith in Brian. Not, not, he just happens to be here. That could be deadly over time if you don't restore. Uh, it's the same thing with an information system. Even if you don't get the precise locations of the troops, if you get enough of my tactics, techniques, procedures, if you get the, the frequencies of the radars I use, if you, if you get the signals that are the, 
the, the frequencies that I use to talk on the radio, that can become deadly. So, so there's an immediate deadly, there's a long-term deadly, and, and I think there's potential for either, depending on the nature of the system you're looking at. Uh, I'll pass it over to the rest of y'all. I'll, uh, I'll add, one, add one point. So um, actually uh, taking one of Ross's points about mission mapping, um, this, the context is, is, what's, is what's more. So what's more dangerous to you when Right. If if you you don't you cannot come close to answering this question if you have not um, looked at your mission or business priorities and and taken an adversarial look at all the infrastructures information and control systems that enable that or that could be used in such a way to cause harm. So um, I I think this this question is infinitely. <laughs> uh, variable in answer because it, to, to, every, to every business, to every business unit, to every, uh, and even changing across time depending on what the environment is at the time, um, there's, there's so many variables in, 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 this, uh, in this situation. Yeah, again, I, I would agree with it depends. Um, obviously, the, the OPM attack, right, um, threatened you know, the identities of, of those who perhaps may have applied for a security clearance or a job in the uh, DOD or the federal government in some capacity. So if you think about people's reputation, their livelihoods, and even their safety and security, information can be extremely damaging over the long term. Um, you know, an interesting case in point was the Sony attack. Um, initially, everyone focused on you know, the, the, the computers locking up and, and, of course, the famous interview movie and other things leaking out and all that sort of thing. But it quickly moved to emails and other things that executives had shared amongst themselves privately that then were spilled across the press and the pages, which led to some unceremonious, you know, resignations of leaders and reorganization of the company. So if you think about command and control hierarchies, you think about those in the military and in the civilian side, if private information leaks out to damage the reputation or undermine that leadership, it could lead to a type of decapitation type of attack through just information warfare, right? By damaging the reputation, causing infighting, causing people to look internally as opposed to staying focused on, hey, we were attacked by an external agent that caused us to come out. We should unify behind those who are trying to do us harm and, and not, not go, you know, devolve into infighting and other things. So there, there are very sensitive information systems that can have strategic effects on command and control systems if an adversary were to expose private communications out of context. And so I think while they may not, you know, kill people immediately or lead to explosions, which are obviously very concerning in the industrial sector, they can still lead and undermine, you know, critical leadership at very sensitive times. I think I would uh, uh, put this. The most uh, common uh, information technology uh, attack is going to be the, uh, other than Sony and Aramco, is going to be uh, ransomware. You get companies hit over here on a weekly basis. And if our systems lock up for a few days or a week, and you might not get your bill, we might not be able to pay bills, it might, and it might affect our communication. However, if the uh, industrial control systems, the command and control get uh, compromised and attacked, that's our energy generation or energy distribution or energy uh, management systems, that can potentially lead to failure and, and outage, electrical outages, which could, as you've heard before, you know, as a cyber Pearl Harbor. If you want to, as uh, the uh, Commander Bean used to, uh, to uh, uh, state that um, if you wanted to soften up the, the military here, if you knock the power out for a week or 10 days, that would be uh, many of the ups and the backups are probably going to not have that much uh, uh, to, uh, to sustain. I don't know what your, your fuel is, and we wouldn't ask. However, uh, most up systems aren't going to be able to run that long at all, and it uh, can become incredibly problematic. So in my opinion, I believe it's going to be the industrial control systems. That's what we really try to, uh, to make sure that we, we watch. Eric? So in my business, I, I think of uh, I've got five areas of uh, things that I protect: uh, the, the the people, the the facility, uh, the systems, the information, and the fifth one that's often forgotten is the operational. What's the mission? So the answer clearly is if you had both of these happening at the same time, which happens with the amount of of, of, of things that happen in our world, you triage it and you need to find out root 
what is what what is the thing that has the most mission impact for you and you have to address it because either one of these scenarios depending on what control system of what that was controlling or what information system this was maybe it was critical maybe it's critical to you maybe it's critical to the business that's being attacked so again that's a strong yes <laughs> <laughs> okay so we're we're getting near the end of our time so what i'm going to do is i'm going to ask uh each person up here if they have any closing comments and then we'll bring the good army captain up here to to close us out so uh who's uh brian you get to go first on this one I appreciate the opportunity, and uh, we have uh, tried to promote as much visibility, actually, to the other agencies and all on the cybersecurity defense that we have tried to put into play. I think that helps, and, and quite frankly, more eyes are better than, 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 than a few. And so we, are, uh, we appreciate the collaborative efforts. I deal with Ross and several other, other issues with things, and the, the collaboration we've got. That's what we find incredibly beneficial. And I think we are, um, I'd like to think that a lot of other places have that capability, but I don't really see that in some of the other energy companies we talk to. So I think we're, we're very privileged to here. So thank you. Eric? I'm happy to be sitting up here with these five experts to my right. Uh, I want to know, has anyone ever tried to have a family member do that cyber awareness uh, class online? Anyone try that with your family? Anyway, uh, the point I want to make, is <laughs> I tried, uh, it didn't work out for me. She says, no, that's your business, that's not my business. Uh, the, 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 cl the closing like suggestion or comment is I want you to, security starts at your home. So I know we are very uh, careful at work, some more than others. That's why I have lots of funny stuff that go across my desk every day. But I want you to think about what is your personal security policy for your home system? How, what information do you have on your personal system that you're trying to protect? Do you keep all your uh, tax returns in your My Documents? Maybe, perhaps, bad guy might have thought of that. You know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just asking you, challenging you all to kind of look at your own personal protection, look at your family's, uh, uh, you know, uh, sharing on Facebook and Twitter and stuff, and because uh, you're, you're not whole if you're not protecting your family. And so that's, that's my parting words. All right, show of hands. How many people here, and you guys are all IT professionals, most of you, how many people here spend a majority of your time on cybersecurity of industrial control systems besides Brian and I? Anybody? <laughs> I see Terry over there. There's another one. Uh, all right, so yeah, that's, that's indicative, and that goes to my first point, is that this community is slow to adapt to this threat. Uh, industrial control system cybersecurity is where... IT cybersecurity was 15 years ago. This community has really done a great job of managing that, managing the risk, as Trevor talked about. It's all about risk management. That same kind of effort is needed in control system cybersecurity. Trevor? Uh, I'm a, I'm a one-issue person, so I, I've, already, I've already shared the, the risk management uh, issue. I, I'll just take a moment to uh, uh, thank you. Thank thank the panel for allowing me to sit amongst uh, amongst amongst you uh, it's a it's an honor to uh, uh, to participate and uh, hopefully this was uh, beneficial to, to to folks that attended thanks and ending with the NSA is the right way to go on a cybersecurity panel <laughs> dr. Runcer yeah so um, I don't want to end on a on a, a gloom and doom point but the one area we didn't have a chance to to discuss but I did want to mention is that you know the pace of of cyber attacks continues to evolve. The intents of the attackers, ransomware wasn't even in our vocabulary two or three years ago. And, and now ransomware is hitting everything from large companies to very small school districts. And, and these attackers are smart, right? They are charging what they think the victim will be willing to pay. So they're actually extracting a tremendous amount of economic uh, productivity out of our economy. Uh, through these types of attacks. But the last thing I wanted to mention was about the Internet of Things, right? So if there's ever a place to start to, um, whether it's at home or at, at business or in the government, to start to be concerned, it's when everything comes with an Internet connection and doesn't function unless it's on the Internet. Um, so we need to better understand what these appliances are, what these devices do. The October 21st attack that some of you may have heard about was the largest denial of the service 
a d denial of service attack ever conducted, and it was conducted through a botnet composed of DVRs and web connected cameras. And it took down one of the large domain name service providers, which is a linchpin to how the internet functions, right? So, I don't know if anyone was, show of hands, who was affected that day? Who couldn't get to Netflix, Google? Is there, yeah, a few people, right? Right, so, so there's a good example of, you know, there's a critical node on the internet, and one of the things that these IoT devices all have in common is they can all send and receive packets, right? They may do sensors, they may control things, they, they may uh, be thermostats, but they all send and receive packets. The attack surface for the Internet of Things will completely dwarf anything we've seen in terms of scale and scope and create disposable botnets that uh, folks will bid on and, and perhaps use at one time for these types of large-scale um, disruption. So we need to be prepared for that. And the best way to be prepared for that is to be conscious of every uh, point of presence we're adding to the network. We've all talked about that. Don't just add it in because the functionality is important. Add it in because you need the functionality and you understand the security. If you can't answer a security question about the device you've added to the network, don't add it in yet. Ask those questions of the vendors. What third-party testing has been done? What security protocols are, are being used? What ports are being opened? All of that needs to be understood before any of these devices are deployed, whether they're in a building or um, you know, they're at home or they're in, inside the government. The reason why I bring that up as a closing point is whether or not we're the victims of the attack, we don't want to be unwitting accomplices to these attacks. It could have been one of our web cameras or one of our DVRs that was involved in that attack. So how much do we actually know about the, the devices that we own and control inside of our own homes. And perhaps the attacker's not coming for us, but they're using our systems, right, for alternative purposes. So that goes back to some of the questions that Eric talked about, which is security um, is something that we need to live, cyber hygiene is something we need to practice, and we need to be vigilant, whether it's at home, at work, inside the government, in classified systems, on the internet, what information we're putting out there, but most importantly, what devices we're connecting. And if we're being good stewards of those devices, we're being responsible caretakers of that to ensure they're not communicating or being used for unauthorized purposes.